This is Healthcare's Missing Logic Podcast, episode number 158. Today, our special guest is Corey Feist. Corey is the president and co-founder of the Dr. Lorna Breen Heroes Foundation. Corey shares with us the noble cause of the foundation in creating a supportive community for clinicians and their families. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Healthcare's Missing Logic Podcast. This is the only podcast that shows you how to leverage polarity intelligence, an essential competency for healthcare leaders, and the missing logic in healthcare, so you can create healthy healing organizations and become a thriving, resilient, and unstoppable healthcare leader. We are your hosts, Tracy Christofferson and Michelle Troset. We've been best friends and colleagues for over 30 years. And during that time, we coached healthcare leaders across North America around how to create healthy healing organizations. Today, we coach healthcare leaders and leadership teams to live thriving, resilient, and balanced lives, combat burnout, and create the best places to give and receive care. This podcast is for the unsung hero of healthcare, the healthcare leader. We want you to know we see you and we'll be here for you each week. In this podcast, we're going to challenge healthcare's industry norms, flip limiting beliefs, and share proven strategies so you can be your best self at working at home, live and lead intentionally, and experience well-being and joy. We are glad you are here and look forward to sharing the journey with you. If you aren't totally convinced this podcast is for you, just listen to a few episodes and convince yourself. Well, welcome everybody to Healthcare's Missing Logic Podcast. This is Tracy. And Michelle. Can you believe that? It's you <laughs> and me again. <laughs> again. <laughs> yes, and we had a very, very wonderful guest today. Yes, we did. We had Corey Feist on our podcast today, and it was an awesome conversation. Oh, uh, what, what what an experience they've had mm-hmm. as a family and uh, and how they've taken that that tragedy, that trauma, and really um, how we're all really, I hate to say it, but benefiting from yeah, right from that experience and that they've really turned this into something very powerful mm-hmm. and they've made so much progress in such a short amount of time. It's amazing. It really is amazing. So it just kind of brings me back to it's not what happens to you, it's how you respond to it. And this family has responded in a fabulous way to really benefit healthcare workers and providers all over the country. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, it was just really, you know, heartwarming too to learn a little bit more about Lorna, who mm-hmm. she was as a person. Right. Yeah. And, um, and then just to, you know, to see the passion that Corey and his family has for what they're doing and how excited they are to see the progress. So I love that he shared a lot of that with us and you're going to love hearing it too. Cause it's, it's very powerful. Yeah. It's a great interview. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to introduce you to Corey and then we will Get on with the interview. So our guest today is J. Corey Feist, JD, MBA, and he is a healthcare executive and has been for over 20 years. And he is the co-founder of the Dr. Lorna Breen Heroes Foundation. And Corey recently served as the chief executive officer of the University of Michigan Physicians Group, the medical group practice of UVA Health comprised of 1,200 plus physicians and advanced practice providers. Corey has authored numerous publications on the need to support the well-being of the healthcare workforce. He has served as an expert in multiple forums, including as a keynote speaker, panelist, and moderator, as well as has provided testimony to the United States Congress. Corey holds an adjunct faculty appointment at the UVA Darden School of Business, He is also the chair of the board of the Charlottesville Free Clinic. Corey holds his master's in business administration from the UVA Darden School of Business, his Juris Doctorate from Penn State Dickinson School of Law, and his bachelor's degree from Hamilton College. And here is our interview with Corey Feist. Well, welcome, Corey. We're so excited to have you on Healthcare's Missing Logic podcast. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. You're so welcome. You're so welcome. You know, we have, uh, we were just so deeply touched by your sister-in-law, Lorna Breen's experience. And we have, you know, shared her story 
uh, as much as we know about it, yeah, uh, on our podcast before, in relationship to the work that we do with healthcare leaders, you know, and really helping, encouraging them to focus on their own well being and to prevent burnout. And we just really would love our listeners to learn a little bit more about Lorna from your perspective, both professionally and personally, and then just you know why you and your wife Jennifer um, started the Dr. Lorna Breen Heroes Foundation. Sure, sure. And again, thank you so much for for having me today and and for uh, allowing me a few moments with your listeners. Um, So Lorna was the crazy aunt to eight nieces and nephews. Uh, She was an avid snowboarder. She was a latecomer to the cello. Uh, I'm not Mm -hmm. sure she could have picked a harder instrument to pick (laughs) up as as an adult. she loved to salsa dance. She loved to travel the world, particularly when she had to study for some board exam or recertification. We'd find a, a text message from her that said, off to, you know, fill in the blank destination to study by myself and learn mm-hmm. about a new culture. She was she was really um, larger than life in many ways and, and as unique as her name, uh, if you will. Uh, she also uh, did highly impractical things like drove a convertible sports car in Manhattan because she just it just felt right for her. <laughs> um, the pragmatist in me, I was like, really? You're going to? OK, whatever. <laughs> uh, but she was she was really larger than life. And, and like it, like so many physicians really decided at an incredibly early age that she wanted to be a physician. And uh, as Jennifer has recounted to me numerous times. Really, her whole life, and Jennifer was 22 months separated from Lorna, um, and so they just talked every day, multiple times a day. They were attached to the hip, but as long as Jennifer could remember, Lorna had one singular goal, and that was to be an emergency room doctor in Manhattan. Mm, that was her yeah. life's goal. Wow. Um, also, to have a cat, and she had both those. <laughs> but, uh, and so, you know, so like so many physicians, Lorna decided in high school, this is what she wanted to do and really was set out uh, to do that. She uh, got uh, got into Cornell. Uh, then she shortly thereafter got a master's at VCU in, in Richmond. Then shortly thereafter got her MD. And then because she understood the work-life balance issues that healthcare can provide, she actually got double boarded and did a did a dual residency in re- in internal medicine and emergency medicine. Wow! Trying to trying to do trying to really focus there on on giving herself options in the future. One of the other ways that she was trying at the time of her death to get uh, to to create options was actually through getting an MBA. She was in she was a student um, in her first year of an MBA program mm-hmm. at Cornell, um, working on the nights and w- on nights and weekends when she wasn't actively practicing medicine and running running an emergency department in Manhattan. So, so Lorna, um, was, uh, had really only ever practiced in New York, which will be important to the story in in a little bit. Um, she trained at Long Island Jewish hospital, Mm -hmm. and then she went to work at New York Presbyterian Allen hospital, where then she became the medical director of the emergency department, you know, and, and, you know, after she died, um, April 26, 2020, um, after receiving really the only mental health treatment of her entire life, she never had any any mental health uh, concerns or any diagnosis or any treatment. But after she died, our family was on the receiving end of a couple things. One was really unwelcome, and then the following was the following that were were, were very welcome and continue to be. But you know our our family story which would and it, which we would have preferred to be a private story mm-hmm. uh, we would have preferred that strongly preferred the grieving process to be a private grieving process sure a confidential grieving process a personal grieving process uh, that choice was ripped from our, our hands uh, by a prominent new york newspaper that published her cause of death 12 hours after she died over our objection and so in that mm-hmm. grief on top of grief, um, in that moment, truly not grief yet, trauma, shock, yeah. um, in this moment of clarity, Jennifer and I decided that we needed to tell Lorna's story in the, as an accomplished physician, as 
this amazing woman that she was not not sensationalize one moment of her of her life and so we then endeavored to step into this arena that was created for us if you will um that was very public and it was really the response that we received to Lorna's death and the national coverage of her death is which was why we created the Dr. Lorna Breen Heroes Foundation in June of 2020 just 2 years ago and it was because of the stories we heard from the healthcare workforce uh, and and at that time I had been practicing um but first law then as a as a as a healthcare leader for almost 20 years at that point and devoted my entire career to the business side and legal side of medicine. But some of the things that were coming out of the, of the mouths of physicians and nurses that I knew for my whole career, as well as those who had reached out to us from across the globe or across the United States or just in town where we are in central Virginia, were shocking. It was truly an unbelievable thing. It was like when you walk down the beach and you see this beautiful you know, set of rocks or shells, and then you flip them over and you see, well, they're not so pretty on the other side. And that was what we were really discovering in real time. And that became the catalyst for the work, which we have now carried forward and will continue to carry forward. Um, and, and so uh, yeah. that's that's why we're here today. Yeah. That's wow. a powerful story. It is. It is. And I, I just, we really admire both you and Jennifer for, Taking something and just realizing that you 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 are here now to do something else with it, and it's in the two years it's been amazing with the foundation has already yeah. how far you've already yeah. come. Yeah. So. Thank you for saying that. It's it's been really 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 hard and ironically rewarding at the same time. Same time. Yeah. Exactly. It, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Bittersweet for it sure. Is. Yeah. Well, one of the foundation's main focuses is to really reduce the stigma, mm -hmm. the, the ugly side of the shell, if you will, on healthcare providers who who do need help. So yeah. They put up with a lot, but they also, when they do need help, there's a stigma about them seeking help. So what have you learned about the existing stigma since Lorna's passing? So it's an excellent question. Uh, one of the things that we learned that that helps can helps catalyze our work and keep us telling this story is that you know when the unspeakable happens to you and you speak of it, it gives others permission to speak too. And so on the good night on the good news side of this coin, um, what we have heard from a stigma perspective is that, we are helping to change the conversation around mental health and the need to take care of oneself and each other, which isn't even mental health. That's just self-care and the care of, exactly. of peers and colleagues. On the other side of that, we know we have a long way to go. And just like there are, st there are stigma, there is a stigma in this culture around uh, mental health and suicide that is really amplified in the healthcare arena where you're not really ever given permission to show any sign of weakness. And for, for those who bring, whose greatest attribute to this uh, is either going to be their hands if they're a, a proceduralist or their brain, but certainly their brain regardless, weakness when it comes to a mental health condition is the most, you know, that's, 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 that's the worst thing you could possibly have because that is really the essence of, of, of what, what value, if you will, you have to offer. So it, the stigma is is there. It is present. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and there are ways, though, that it is changing. And I'll give you one great example. And I, I don't have the card at my desk within arm's reach. But, you know, there are programs like the um, Stress First Aid Program, which you may have heard of, where those uh, with, a sh with the Short Center for Compassionate Care um, in Boston has rolled out and they've adapted it from the military. But it uses colors as a proxy for stress injury and levels of stress injury. And I was just doing a site visit earlier this week at a very large health system in the Mid-Atlantic. And I said, I have a hypothesis. And they said, yeah. They said, my hypothesis is that by using colors to talk about your feelings and where you are on the stress continuum, you're getting more participation because you've created a new language. You don't have to say, you don't have to get into all the gory details. You have to just, you can just say, literally, I just show I'm red today or I'm orange today and I need help. 
And so there are, th- and, mm-hmm. and they were like, absolutely, that's exactly what we've seen. And we've seen it proliferate. So what I would share with you is, again, on the positive side, I think there's an active conversation. There's definitely much more of a, much more of an open conversation. And we just need to keep talking about it because while there are so many solutions to these complex problems that we that the healthcare workforce have right now, and many of those solutions are complex in nature, some of them are as simple as taking a two minute well being break at the begin a well being moment at the beginning of a team meeting and just doing a check in doesn't cost mm-hmm. any money it costs two minutes of time. Mm-hmm. And can literally be life saving, right? And that's and that's the kind of thing yep. that we're that we're seeing proliferate from yep. Laura's death. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, really. That's you know that's wonderful that that you're already starting to see how those small. It just doesn't have to be anything big. To your point, right? Yeah, it's just give attention to it and give it a minute or two, right? That right. and that and people are receptive to that, right? They're just waiting. Really, underneath, they're waiting for permission. I think, yeah, right? yeah. And and I'll just share with you this. There's, I've I've now heard this story repeated multiple times. And I'll go back to stress first aid. Nurse shows up for the well being moment. She puts her little dot on red. Everyone looks at her and they say, "Hold on a minute, you look totally fine." And she's clearly not. And they just stop everything. She didn't want to burden anyone. Right. Staffing levels are low, whatever that might be. But the team was like, hold on a minute. We have, you have to take care of yourself first in order to take care of patients and do your best job taking care of patients. You have to take care of yourself. Yeah. There's a direct relationship between that and the quality of the care you're going to provide. So here's an idea. You go home, you go get help, and we're going to help figure that out. And that was one of the great success stories that we've heard. And as you just said, it literally took two minutes it, and it didn't take you know, literally, we'll talk about an act of Congress in a little bit, but it didn't yeah. take an act of Congress. It didn't take <laughs> it didn't take hundreds of millions of dollars of no. hospital redesigning processes. It took two minutes, and yeah. so part of part of part of where we need to really lean into are how many of those little two minute options we can we can provide in in the day to take care to look out for ourselves as well as our colleagues. Yeah. 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 That's exactly. a great example. What what do you what do you think reinforces the stigma though? Like what do you what what causes that stigma to be there? What have you learned yeah, about perpetuates that? Perpetuates it. Yeah. I, I think societally, you know, societally still on mental health, we've got a long way to go. That's when true. it comes to suicide, it's incredibly long way to go. I talk about the yeah. fact that as a junior as a junior father, as a junior father, <laughs> when I became a father, I became a junior pediatrician on the playground, listening to other parents talk about how little Johnny's got like little dots on his hand, his feet, and his mouth. That means that's hand, foot, and mouth. Well, right. you don't have anything like that in suicide as an example, because no one talks about it. Very few people talk about mental health still. So, so I think that culturally and so- yeah. it, from a society perspective, we have a long way to go. I do think that generationally it is different the generations that are in medical schools and nursing schools right now not only have a much more openness to talking about mental their own mental health but they also have a different expectation about the way they're going to be treated when they get out exactly which is which is which is different right so but but if you if you if you kind of go back to i don't want to say root cause but if you the, one of the one of my hypotheses about the way that this is all reinforced really comes before before, and I'll, I'll pick on doctors for a second and just pull that through line for a second. When a doctor decides to be a doctor, it is often before you even go to college, right? I mean, there, there are a few professions where you really have to decide that early. Uh, but certainly when you get to college, you then obviously take all the, the difficult pre-med courses and then you apply. Well, I've heard from so many medical students that even in the application process to medical school, they are coached by their med school advisors. So these are undergraduate institutions. Their med school advisors are saying, don't write anything down on your application about prior mental health. So that's one of the, you know, it starts early and it's often. And then the other places where it is reinforced that it is absolutely unacceptable to get mental health treatment are in almost every application that a doctor or nurse has to fill out to work. So, and we published yeah. in, in June, of, I'm sorry, in September of 2021, we published an article in U.S. News and World Report where we identified six areas where this exists. And four of the six 
that we identified are literally in questions that they have to have to answer. So those are licensure questions, whether at the state or at the at the specialty board level. They are applications to work in a hospital called credentialing questions. They're applications mm-hmm. to get covered by malpractice insurance. They're applications to get covered to to get paid by an insurance company. Um, the list goes on and on. And the challenge there is that in every single way, those questions exist. They reinforce to the work to the worker, the, the healthcare professional, that they have to ignore their mental health. That that talking mm-hmm. about mental health is is a big no no. And you know, as a consequence of of all of these things and the culture that reinforces it, and the and the and literally the structural barriers to mental health access that exist. What do we have? I just talked to a doctor in New York who's an addiction specialist recently who said we have a proliferation of addiction issues in healthcare professionals right now like they have never seen. Wow. So because yeah. as it turns out, people are human and they need somewhere to they need to they need something yeah, release. to cope with. They need mm-hmm. release, cope. yep. And so yep. numbing. Mm-hmm. They're they are literally doing that and not literally not permitted in many cases to get the help they need because if they do, and this was the issue that, that Lorna had, she got mental health treatment once. She'd only worked in New York state, which is a state that actually doesn't have questions in their licensure application around this or their reapplication. They just don't even ask questions, but she was so convinced that it, she was going to lose her license that literally this is one of the last things she told us before she died wow. is that I'm going to lose my license. I'm never going to practice again. And, you know, if you think about just that law, how, Ugh. how, if you have to decide you're going to enter a career in high school and your whole life and career is building to this point, your identity becomes so inextricably linked with your profession, yes. being able just con- the concept of not being able to do what you've trained your whole life to do, what you, dr- what your dreams are made of. Right. It literally can cause you to take your own life Yeah, yeah. or not yeah. see another way out of this box. Right. 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 Yeah. 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 Well, just knowing what she knew about that stigma, right? Like this is it. I can exactly. imagine, exactly. I can imagine those were the thoughts. Right. And, and so, and so just, just, a, a doctor pointed this out to me within the last year or so. I, I think it's it, it connects these last two questions, but it's perfect. So if the culture had been at the time of her death, a check-in culture, a, ch- mm-hmm. a self-check or a check-in on another culture, this physician took me aside at a national meeting and he said, Corey, I just want to ask you a question. He said, if someone had taken her aside in that moment, when she went back to work on April 1st, 2020, and she was clearly still sick, very sick with COVID. She just didn't have a fever, but she was sick with COVID and she was incredibly depleted. If someone had just tapped her on the shoulder or said, where are you, where is your, or where's your stress, you know, injury level? Are you a red or an orange? And someone had said, you're not well, go home. He asked, he said, would we be having this conversation? And I, and I paused because I hadn't thought about it at that point. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I don't even know you. I don't, I literally don't know you. We never have this conversation. You never hear this name in the national news over and over again. You never hear about the feist trying to take this on. Mm -hmm. Because as it turns out, the culture is one that's supporting of of the well-being of the workforce, the mental health and other well-being of the workforce. So like we said before, some of this stuff is much – doesn't – doesn't take an act of Congress to solve, but it does take a cultural shift. It takes Mm -hmm. a – it -hmm. takes a shift in a lifting of these burdens that – plague the healthcare industry and really are not doing anyone any favors right? Um, and keeping them from getting the help that they need. Right. Right. Oh, so true. So true. So, um, you know, we're, we're a bit of policy geeks here, Michelle and I, we've been to the Hill to advocate for interprofessional collaborative practice. And we know, you know, it's critical for everybody to work together to coordinate care delivery and, and to help lift the burden by working yeah. together as a team, right? To support the well-being of each other and the patient and clinician experience gets better when you're working and tapping into the strengths of everybody on the team. And we love that the Lorna Breen Foundation had bipartisan support for the Lorna Breen Act. So we'd really like you to tell our listeners a little of the behind the scenes about making that happen. And then tell us a little bit about the act and what it does. Will do. Um Unbelievable. 
unbelievable. Um, Within the first month of Lorna's passing, Jennifer and I received a phone call from the United States Senator for Virginia named Tim Kaine, an individual we had no contact with prior. If I, if I could describe the call and that reach out, it literally felt like exactly what any member of you know your elected representative should do, right? Family tragedy, they pick up the phone, they call, they say, how can you help? And that's how the conversation went. Now, Senator Kane had read, read Lorna's story, understood the connection, was, and literally, out of the goodness of his heart, you know, I, I need to reach out to these people and I need to see how I can help. His son had at that point was in the was was in the Marines and was very familiar with he was very familiar with um, what the armed forces had done on the mental health side. And he just said, how can I help now when he did? I'm not sure he recognized that I had been in healthcare for 20 years and was going to give him a very detailed email <laughs> reply. Um, but we worked <laughs> with a bipartisan coalition from the very beginning because we realized that this is a newer issue and for anyone to get any traction, it has to be bipartisan. Mm -hmm. And we also recognize just what you were saying before is that healthcare is a team sport and we need Mm -hmm. everybody who participates in healthcare to opine as to what is going to make an impact here. Now I want to point something out to your listeners that, that is also important with this law. We designed this law in the summer of 2020. Think about where COVID has been since the summer of 2020. Yeah. I don't know that we would have done anything different, but when people say, well, gosh, it doesn't go far enough, I would say, you're exactly right. And it was never intended to be a solution to all the world's problems or this problem. It was a, it was intended and continues to be intended to be a first couple steps down the up, up, up the staircase of policy yeah. that we're building. Yeah. Uh, but it is amazing to think about, we created the, the drafts of the law in the summer of 2020 and just who would have thought we would still be in the summer of 2022, talking about surges and masks and exhaustion and all the rest of it. But so we, in, we created this law. It, it has four components to it. The first two are very similar. So I bucket the two. Um, and before I go into those, I just want to point out, this is the first ever law at the federal level that is focused on the well-being of the healthcare workforce. Mm-hmm. Wow. So that is that's wow. the context here. So again, we are building yeah. this staircase. So the first four steps of the staircase, if you will, mm-hmm. um, are programs to support the well-being of the uh, current workforce. So that's step one. Mm-hmm. Step two, programs and grants at, sh- at teaching institutions mm-hmm. to work on the well-being of the trainees read into that medical students, nursing mm-hmm. students, pharmacy mm-hmm. students, you know, whatever those may be. Um, those two first steps um, are included in uh, the funding for those were, were included in the uh, American Rescue Plan, which was President Biden's first COVID package. Mm-hmm. And $103 million of grants were allocated January 20th, 2022 to uh, the award recipients for those mm-hmm. first two steps of mm-hmm. the law, which we are just, I mean, it, we were blown away. Mm-hmm. The third step of the law is a, is a national awareness campaign focused on employers and individuals, individual healthcare workers focused on improving well-being. And that, that national awareness campaign is being run by the CDC. And I'll tell you who's about who's helping them in a second because that's also okay. super exciting. Yeah, that's good. Um, the fourth is a comprehensive study of the root causes of these issues, which will then be a uh, a springboard or or a or a um, a path forward for us for future policy. Mm-hmm. But let me come back to numbers. Mm. Well, you've heard number you've heard number number one and two, mm-hmm. which were allocated. But we just we um, at the Lorna Breen Foundation worked with a uh, w- with a communi- with a communications firm called JPA Health and submitted a uh, a proposal to the CDC and just received the award to help run that national awareness campaign. Oh wow! Uh, oh, wow. Which will go yeah for the next two years, which is really exciting. So we're working <sighs> with CDC and their arm. Um, their arm focused on occupational safety, which is 
uh, called NIOSH, which is a long acronym mm-hmm. that I can't spell yeah. or recite. The, mm-hmm. the, you know, but but they're the occupational safety arm. And it is focused very, and, and it will be focused first and foremost on systems solutions. This is not about making the workforce more resilient. This is not about, you know, barring from the canary in the coal mine, making the canaries more resilient. This is about redesigning the coal mine. And that's the way NIOSH and the CDC are leaning. And that's in line with all of the National Academy report and the Surgeon General's ad- advisory mm-hmm. that just came out. So we are thrilled to basically be able to take that work and then for the next two years, implement a national awareness campaign. And oh, to be great. part of that and advising on it is just incredibly humbling. Uh, um, and I don't have an update on where the study is, but we know there's a lot of data out there already, but we're already in active conversations on how we can create the the steps five through you know infinity. Mm-hmm. Um, but I will just say, as, as we kind of keep going here, yeah. There were three pieces of feedback that we received. Unif- you know, they, they always seem to fall into three buckets uh, to the law. The first is incredible gratitude and appreciation for helping to change the healthcare landscape, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which again is one of those moments where you're like, I, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's yeah. an honor and a privilege and I can't believe you're saying that. Number two, what are you going to do about these mental health barriers that are appear as questions on credentialing applications mm. in state state and specialty licensure. That's number two. It, okay. And I've gotten tons of feedback. And number three is help me get rid of this administrative burden because this administrative burden is the thing that mm. caused my burnout before the pandemic and continues to cause it now. Yeah. And so all of, you know, to me, that was great, f- you know, particularly that second and third piece. That's, that's where we're focused. And we continue to be focused moving forward. And so we don't have to wait for another iteration of the law. We don't have to wait. If those are if those are things that we're hearing, we're continuing to work on on them right now and trying to make continue to make an immediate and long term impact on this issue from a policy mm-hmm. perspective. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, that was what you've done has been very successful in a very ah, short period of time yes. when you think about. Because we do know a little bit about policy. It can take yeah. a long time. time so I yeah. just think it's really awesome. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and I'll tell you, we, we had a little event after the, sen- the Senate. The Senate unanimously passed this bill. Um, and then the House passed a slight different bill that had a it had just a date, a date that for the study. It was the the House ver- the Senate version was a five year study. The House version was a three year study. So they had to go back to the Senate again and have them unanimously pass it again before it could go to President Biden's desk. So when they did that, Senate passing unanimously for the second time, uh, we were in Capitol Hill for a little celebration. It was one of our first in person, and all of these people in in DC oh. were coming up to us. They're like, two year less than two years? Are you kidding me? I know. It, it, it can take eight to 10 years to st- or 20, you know, that was sitting, we were sitting waiting to go into the Oval Office and I was speaking with a member of Congress who said, I got something that's been in draft for 20 years. Yeah. So unbelievable, right? So yeah. um, we are just, it, it, but it speaks to the need. This is, this sure. is a law that has the name of my sister-in-law. It has nothing to do with our family. We have right. been champions of it and yeah. completely honored because she cared so deeply about her colleagues and the well-being of her colleagues. Mm-hmm. We're so honored that it was named after her, but let's be abundantly clear. This is for the healthcare workforce. For and the reason why Congress acted as fast as it did is we were able to elevate stories and you know this whole conversation we've been having mm-hmm. around the things that we have discovered along the way, sharing those with members of Congress, they're horrified. They're like, what are you talking oh. about? There are these barriers that exist. What are you talking about that the culture is the way it is? Mm-hmm. That doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. And so we've shared that and they've said we're acting and yeah. they've moved forward. Yeah. Well, there is just a huge sense of urgency Mm -hmm. and because things are not, things are almost worse than they were during COVID, right? And the the peak of the surge with all of the fallout, all of the other things that are now happening, right? And, and, and let's face it, we're not just talking about the healthcare workers. We're talking about every person in the United States is impacted by this because we get care in these facilities and from these individuals. So this is a national crisis. I mean, really, mm-hmm. when you think about it, right? Mm-hmm. It's it's everybody's at risk uh, when we can't have a strong healthcare workforce to care for us and our children. And absolutely, right? Absolutely. You're, and the and the the linkage here that I think is really important for everyone to. There are two things that are really important 
for everyone to recognize in that regard, is that there's a direct relationship between the quality of patient care yep. and the well-being of the workforce. Exactly. So um, that is data that is still, you know, there is oh, yeah. data out there. There's there a is. data that suggests there's a two, at least a 200% increase in medical errors. But then the second part about this is um, for healthcare leaders and others to recognize that what we're talking about here, by and large, is just healthcare operations 2.0. This is not necessarily a bunch of, you know, meditation apps and 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 yoga classes. Uh, a, a physician I just talked to in DC recently said, when we started this, my boss came up to me and said, "We're not going to be able to yoga our way out of this," and and I said. You know, I love yoga and meditation, but that's not what this is. So even sometimes we talk about it as well-being and we use that term. I think people immediately go towards things like, you know, get out your candles and incense and all that. And and that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is really how do you operate a system that looks out for the worker and the patient mm -hmm. when you're delivering it? Yep. And so how do we redesign it and think about both? Because healthcare in my entire career, we only ever talked about was the patient. And I think yeah. it's heavily dominated by, yeah. and that's great. It's what it's for, yeah. but you cannot ignore the worker. No. The impact it's, of the work on the worker is significant, yeah. obviously. Yeah. 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 Um, it's the patient experience and the clinician experience. Yeah, it's right? the, a whole lesson we learned from the triple aim that mm -hmm. it ev eventually six, eight years later evolved into the quadruple aim because we were missing the clinician. So it's a very important exactly. bo yeah. both and approach. And while, you know, I really hear you about the yoga and meditation, one of the things we've been focusing on is the and both system changes that need to happen. Absolutely. But a deep personal transformation of well-being of every worker in the system too and the personal responsibility we all own for our own health and when we get that going it's gonna yeah. it's really gonna well and as healthcare yeah. workers we're natural care for everybody else yes and not care for ourselves so we have to do that we have to um look at how we've been indoctrinated as healthcare workers, right? And just those deep yeah. beliefs about everybody before me. And we have to make those shifts and we can't make those shifts without some personal work. And, and I'll tell you just along those lines, part of, what, part of what I've been thinking about is, so to that end, what is, how can we hook, how can we create a hook, right? Yeah. So to me, one of the, one of the ways to create that hook is around quality, because I know that everyone yeah. is focused on the quality. And so connecting mm -hmm. your self-care to your patient care, I, I, I use the term kind of whole human PPE. You know, we thought so much about how PPE protects us and our patients. This is I'm literally like sitting at a desk with PPE sitting next to me <laughs> but to think about. And that was not an intended prop. It just is where we are in the Feist family these days is everyone's uh -huh. got it everywhere still. But the, the concept that self-care is a critical form of PPE before you go into the patient. Yes. Mm -hmm. Exam room. Yeah. It's just, it's, you can't see it. You can't touch it like this. Yeah. Here's a blue mask. I had a exactly. pink one before. Here's a blue mask. I've got all flavors here. Uh, <laughs> but it's, um, and if we can get the workforce thinking about it that way, maybe we get a chance. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Well, we've been we've been definitely dipping our toe into that space and and we've been intentionally working with healthcare leaders. Um, we we noticed that a lot of effort went to the front line as it needed to be, as it should have been. So much was happening on the front line, but we also noticed that there weren't a lot of people focusing on the leaders and we see them as the linchpins of the system and if they're not healthy and practice well-being, it's going to impact everyone in the system as well. So what advice would you have, to, you know, for healthcare leaders and administrators to what their part is on this and then how they can really um, kind of take on the mission that you have at the foundation too, to reduce burnout and improve workforce well-being? So leaders are absolutely critical to this entire conversation. In fact, mm -hmm. if you look at the National Academy's report that just came out um, and their mm -hmm. final report, which is which is coming out in late June, it's it, it it has three columns to it, an impacted column, and then who's responsible is the far right. And if you let your eye just kind of follow the page, you see the healthcare leaders are like at least seventy five or eighty percent of the time listed. Yeah. So they're they're the linchpin, as you say. Yeah. They're the linchpin to making this happen. They're the ones who who are going to enable it and encourage it and allow it to happen. Yeah. 
to me, healthcare leaders need to recognize what I said before, which is this is hospital operations 2.0. Mm-hmm. And this is about, and I've done this work professionally right. where you include, when you look at process redesign and you think about it from the perspective of the patient or in, in lean management terms, you would call that the customer, the customer defines the value. Think about making sure that the worker is in, in that room when processes are being redesigned to, Im, to consider what is, the, what is the impact on the worker. And if you can get upstream of that problem and redesign it so that the impact on the worker is minimized and the patient is satisfied or the patient's seizure met, that's, that's, your, that's your golden, I don't know if it's a triangle, it's, it's, what, your, it's what your aim is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think healthcare workers are, I mean, sorry, the healthcare leadership team is incredibly mm-hmm. Um, incredibly uh, critical to this. And one of the things that we did early on was we recognized in our partnering model that we needed to bring tools to the healthcare work uh, leadership. Mm -hmm. And so we created an initiative called All In Wellbeing First for Healthcare. It's called, it's uh, information is at allinforhealthcare.org. And we have tools for leaders so that they don't have to wonder what our best practice is. Mm. They okay, have great. we have tools and they're all free, so That's it's great. a matter of just going to that roadmap and 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 mm-hmm. taking them through that exercise. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And then and then they and I, as you alluded to or stated directly, recognize that healthcare leaders are human too, and they need to take oh. a break and they need to be looking out for themselves and each other because yeah. we need them just like we need the rest of the healthcare yeah. workforce. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, they're exhausted and burning out as well, and Absolutely. leaving leaving yeah. in droves, right? And so, yeah, so mm-hmm. it's, it, it's all, you know, it could all collapse. <laughs> I mean, essentially, right? So That's we've right. got to really um, move forward and move quickly yeah. and intentionally. And, um, yeah. and so, yeah, yeah, it's, it's just, it's and an incredible they're time. they're critical to changing the culture, which started yeah. out, Absolutely. we start our conversation about yeah. the culture. And so. they're not going to be in a space to be able to make the changes that need to be made if they're exhausted and they can't think critically and That's, they can't get right. the attention yeah. to it, right? And, and the last comment I would make is to also recognize this does not take hundreds of millions of dollars of investment. Yeah. I think that's one of the very first reactions you get is, oh my gosh, this is one more thing. If you think about it yeah. from the perspective of this is just your, hosp- your healthcare operations and how you're exactly. working with the team to get their feedback, then it maybe it becomes a, lo- a little bit more manageable because you already have yeah. a budget to get that done. It's just really making sure that you're focusing. It's, a, it's an opportunity to focus. Yes. Um, yes. The last comment I would make, I said this was the last comment before, but never trust a lawyer <laughs> who says that. Um, but to reinforce your point, after the first year of the pandemic, the American Medical Association published the results from their coping with COVID-19 survey, which was a survey of the entire healthcare workforce. Yeah. And the healthcare workforce across the board, I, um, about 50% of them, just slightly less than 50% of them felt valued and supported by their organizations, yeah. mm. including leaders. And so one yeah. other thing that healthcare leaders can be doing right now is literally going yeah. at the elbow to, yeah. to the workforce and saying, how can I help you feel valued and supported? What does that mean for you, Michelle, to feel valued mm-hmm. and supported yeah. every yeah. day? Yeah. Because there is a direct linkage between one's feeling of value and support and actually their own personal resilience and susceptib- mm-hmm. susceptibility to burnout. So mm-hmm. there are some mm-hmm. tangible things just with that, even just knowing that. That, that they can do to start a yeah. conversation and mm-hmm. listen mm-hmm. Yeah. to the workforce. Definitely. Definitely. Well, we know you've been on a lot of podcasts, a lot of radio shows. <laughs> all, you've been talking and talking and talking, right, for two years. <laughs> so I'm a wanted, lawyer. I'm trained to talk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we've been really listening, so I just want you to oh, know that. Thank you. And I think we just wanted to give you uh, an opportunity to, to say if there's anything that you haven't been able to say on any of the platforms you've been on or anything that we didn't ask that you feel is like you feel a burning desire to share, we wanted to give you that chance to do that. Yeah, we have. Um, thank you for that. And thank you for recognizing I've been on a couple of these things. Uh, we've <laughs> we've reached now over 200 million people with this story. Wow, that's great. And uh, we know that we just are going to keep talking about it because we know it. if I keep getting invited, that's telling me that someone's listening. So that's good. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a very big announcement coming up about our organization mm-hmm. and how we're going to grow our organization. And that's coming up. In on the, uh, I don't know when this podcast is going to air, but this 
uh, we will have a big announcement uh, mid-month in June. So mm. make sure to go to drlornabreen.org mm. for our big announcement because okay. we are we are continuing to uh, even uh, try to magnify our impact on this issue or amplify our impact on this issue and 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 create uh, a place a place that others can can kind of step into this arena mm-hmm. with us. So so just I'll, I'll tease that by saying. More to come, and uh, just if, if anyone is interested in reaching out or, or speaking further about it, all our contact information is on our website at drlornerbreen.org. Right. Uh, we're all over social media. My kids give me a ton of flack for the fact that we don't have millions of followers. So uh, <laughs> no one, they, they keep saying no one's going to take you seriously till you hit five million. So I think we're in the, we're still in the thousands. We're still in the thousands. So hey, yeah, follow but, us on social media. Oh, uh, <laughs> all right, we'll do that. We, well, yeah, we already are. are. Yeah. We already yeah. are. There you go. Yeah. They already are. That's great. Yeah. And uh, great post to it. Actually, you're very informative. You're keeping people informed of what was happening. So I really appreciate that. It's all, all the news that's fit to print. Somebody says, actually, that's, that's, I can't take that one. So I think the Washington Post takes that. But yeah, we're, we are really trying to, trying to be a resource and also bring hope because there is, out of, out of all of this, there's hope. Yes. There's hope. And yep. there are solutions. And we just need to, a collective commitment to implement them. Yeah. Right. We believe that too. Oh, yes, we, we, we do. We believe that yes, too. Yes, we do. All right, Corey, it's time for our missing questions. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. So we're going to ask you, I'm going to ask you a couple of uh, fun questions and then Tracy's going to give you a wrap up question. So here we go. What is your idea of an ideal family vacation? Oh, um, <laughs> that is a trip to Montana. Ooh. It involves a little fly fishing where all the fish are returned to the safety of their river. And uh, we are we do hiking in Glacier National Park, mm. uh, looking for uh, colorful rainbow-colored rocks. You might guess that I'm about to go to Glacier Park with my family. <laughs> my daughter wants to see those. She's got a bucket list of, of, uh. of places to go, but... That would be, that's my ideal is to get out either, either to Montana or uh, get on a sailboat that I do not sail myself, but someone else sails and just kind of be out there and just be together Mm. in a beautiful place where we can relax and just appreciate each other. Enjoy the beauty of nature and the people, and the people you love. Oh, I love it. That's awesome. Yeah, I love it. All right. My second question is if you were handed a golden invitation to meet anyone in the world alive today who would you want to meet and why? Um, I have to- had, I have had uh, for the last two years on almost a daily basis, I have had a, a, at least one Brene Brown moment. Mm-hmm. I have had, I have been the uh, vulnerable, I have, I have exposed my vulnerability, uh, infinity times now. I would love to meet her. Yeah. I think that work that she's doing is great. And, uh, and I really hope to be emulating, um, the, what she's kind of putting out there. So yeah, that's great. I'd like to meet Brene. Ah, oh, awesome. That's awesome. Great choice. I was listening to her in my walk this morning. <laughs> and see, she's everywhere. She's she everywhere. Is. Yeah, she's she everywhere. She is. She is. Well, as you know, we work with healthcare leaders to kind of develop this competency of polarity intelligence and really understanding these interdependent, um, you know, values and points of view. And what we know about polarities is oftentimes we have a preference pole. So we kind of tend to lean one way a little bit more than the other sometimes. And uh, so we just wanted to check in with you on a specific polarity and which might be your preference pole. So process or progress, which one do you lean more towards? I used to be on the process side, but I got to tell you, the last two years have made me made me swing towards the progress side. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> process yeah. is important, but progress with process with no progress is just a lot of talking. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That does yeah. fit your story really well. Yeah. yeah. It does. It makes <laughs> sense. I, but honestly, I used to be very process. I mean, I I'm probably both. Yeah. But 
uh, you know, everyone. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. 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 Probably much, probably more on the progress side. If, if, and I think we're a walking example also that if you actually shed a lot of the bureaucratic nature of just things, yeah. I didn't have a lobbyist as an example to do the, the, yeah. I mean, the lobbyists in DC hate me for saying that, but like, I didn't have a hired gun to do the, to the, just, you know, we just did a lot of grassroots and got a lot, you know, just partnered with people. So that's sure. a great example. Like we didn't have a big infrastructure. This is a very small organization mm-hmm. and yet we've been able to move, move the needle significantly. Right. Uh, yeah. And right. I think we're a good example that you don't have to have hundreds of millions of dollars to come and you make are. a big impact. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it makes total sense because sometimes, our preferences change depending on the circumstance we find ourselves in, right? And the situations that we experience. So that makes perfect sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, Absolutely. So, such a pleasure to be with you today. And thank you yes. so much yeah. for sharing Lorna's story and your own and all the incredible work that you're doing. And we're here cheering you on. We and are. Ready to help in any way we can. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, this has been a great help just by having me and, and allowing me to share uh, Lorna's story as well as our, our work. And, um, you know, you all are doing amazing things too. So thanks for having me. And please sure. let me know if there's ever any anything that you or any of your listeners need. We're happy to help. Okay. Um, yeah. Like I said, it's at drlornabreen.org is, is our is mm-hmm. where you can find all lots of information about yeah. us. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Corey. And uh, we definitely will be keeping in touch. And for all of our listeners out there, this is a wrap for another Healthcare's Missing Logic podcast. Stay safe and stay healthy, and we'll see you on our next podcast. Bye. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Healthcare's Missing Logic podcast, now a top-rated podcast for healthcare leaders. Please share this podcast with other healthcare leaders and anyone else you think would benefit. We are certain that if you found value in it, they will too. If you haven't already done so, please hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any episodes. And also, it would mean the world to us if you took a quick moment to leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast player. It helps to get the word out about our podcast and incredible guests. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you want to watch our podcasts. You can also follow us on our Missing Logic social media channels, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Until next time.